I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Hope. We all need it. God bless you, Nathan, as you open God's word to us. Pastor Bob and, and Mark, it's a joy to be with you again this morning and to uh, be here actually in the, in, in the middle of the summer. <laughs> Isn't it crazy, uh, uh, the, the seasons that we have? You know, this is a, this is a crazy year. Um, I want to do a little bit this morning, uh, uh, for those of you who are new and don't know who I am, and, and that's okay, I want to give you a little orientation to who I am, what our organization is, and then I want to get into the message this morning. So I'm with Assist Church Expansion. Uh, our organization works with our family of churches. Uh, our family of churches that you're part of here uh, is uh, the Karis Fellowship of Churches. We have about 220 churches in the United States and Canada. We have thousands of churches internationally, but, but here in the U.S. and Canada, we have about 220 churches. And our vision is to see our fellowship our vision is to see our fellowship become a movement, and that's by see if we can our, see our family grow by 5% annually by 2030. So we're working towards that goal. And part of that goal is, is not only to, to see new churches started, but also to see the churches that we have thrive and grow and reach lost people. That's our ultimate goal. I live in Canada. I have a wife. Uh, my wife's name is Jennifer. Two boys, Isaiah and Micah, uh, 18 and 14. Uh, my youngest one is actually enjoying online learning. I don't know how he is, because I, I would not enjoy that at all. But my oldest one hated it. He finished his last year of high school online learning. He didn't like it at all. And my youngest one's like, you know, Dad, I'm not distracted by all the other kids in the class, because I usually end up talking and picking on people and making jokes, and the teacher's always mad at me. But here, there's nobody but me. <laughs> so I can actually listen and focus on the teacher. So I thought that was an interesting perspective on the online, uh, uh, the, the, the online thing that he's doing. But anyway, so our, I'm with our fellowship, and I'm working to help uh, our churches uh, to grow uh, and move forward. There's a number of projects we're doing. We've, we've been functioning for about three years as Assist Church Expansion. We have about 22 projects across the U.S. and Canada, a number of church plants, as well as uh, revitalization and restart projects. And I wanted to just highlight a couple of them for you this morning so you can be praying for our fellowship uh, as, as we move ahead. This is Tim Walmetti. I think I introduced him to you uh, the last time I was here, but Tim is the new pastor at the Batascala Grace Brethren Church, and their church is in revitalization, uh, and they've partnered with us about a year and a half ago. Tim has been there for about nine months, and, and uh, he's just been ordained in our family uh, just recently, so uh, he's a great guy. Their church is moving forward in a, in a really positive direction. Uh, in fact, they just had a trunk or treat, uh, uh, Pastor Bob, this past, well, two weekends ago. At their trunk or treat, they had over 1,000 cars show up to their church. This is just incredible uh, opportunity that God is giving them. So now I'm not saying that the, all those people are coming back to the church on Sunday. They were hoping, but, <laughs> but, but the fact that they're starting to see new stuff happen and new energy, new connections to the community. Uh, pray for the Batascala church as they work to revitalize their church family there. Um, this is a, a new church restart. Uh, that's in Lakeland, uh, Florida. This church was down to, is down to five people. And so this, this couple, the Wits, uh, Orrin and Kara and their beautiful little girls, have moved there. They just moved there last month. They just moved into Lakeland, and uh, they are praying that God would allow them to restart that church. Can you pray for them? Can you pray that they would see success there, that God would use them to uh, re restart that church and help it to actually reach lost people and grow and thrive? Um, of course, ultimately, the, the goal for us isn't that we just have large churches and people are growing, but that we're actually seeing new people come to know and follow Jesus, and uh, that's really the ultimate goal for, for all of us uh, in this process. Uh, this morning, as Pastor Bob was talking about, and so is Mark, uh, we, were, we want to talk about hope a little bit. You know, in this season, this journey that we're in right now is pretty crazy, 2020, <laughs> The, the year that keeps on giving <laughs> doesn't stop re relentlessly giving us more challenges and struggles and heartaches, and, and it's a really, really fascinating year that we're in. But I thought I'd like to share a message of hope this morning, and, and, and Pastor Bob uh, has shared some scripture already in this space. But I want us to look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 to 24. Uh, you can read them here, or if you want to open your Bible or uh, open up your phone, that's fine. 
But Lamentations 3, 19 to 24, it's really interesting. Here's the prophet Jeremiah, who's in exile with the children of Israel uh, and longing to be back to, to Jerusalem. And uh, his situation is really horrible. It's, it's horrendous. Uh, they have all these expectations, all these desires, all these promises that God has given them, and yet they are separated from, from the land that God has promised them, and he's, uh, he's considering his situation. And let's read the first couple of verses here. He says, I remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. And what happens to us when we start to focus on the reality of the world that we live in, and this world isn't what it's supposed to be, it isn't what it's meant to be. And the more we push into the world around us, the more we realize this. And the more we focus on our circumstances and our inability to actually see any change or make anything happen, and, and how uh, desperate we are as human beings, our own situation, physical situations. Some of you are wrestling with sickness, some of you are wrestling with health, some of you are wrestling with decisions your children are making or your spouse is making or other people are making which you have no control over. And life becomes pretty discouraging and pretty frustrating. We live in a, in a, in a world that's cursed with sin, that's headed for a direction, uh, that is out of control, and we, we have so much limited power to change anything. So when we focus on ourselves and we focus on our circumstances, we get really consumed with the reality that we have no control, and sometimes we're the biggest problem <laughs> in the equation of things that we're looking at, and we're so disgusted with ourselves and we have no hope, right? The world that we live in, if we, if we keep our eyes here, we keep our eyes inward, we keep our eyes downward, we are going to be left without hope. Because the reality is, is we're sinners and we're, we're in a place with sinners uh, and we're hurting each other. We have situations where we have no control. But he says this, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. I call this to mind and I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. So when he stops looking down and he stops looking around and he starts looking up, he starts to have hope, right? Our hope is where? Is in the Lord. So I look up from where our help comes from. That's, that's from the Lord itself. But it's interesting when he says here, he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. I bring this back to, to my memory. I know it's the truth and I keep forgetting it. And that's the thing with us is who follow Jesus. We know the truth about Jesus, but we keep forgetting it. We keep putting it away. We keep focusing our energy on our current circumstances, focusing on energy on things that we can't control, focusing on our energy on other people who are making decisions that are out of our control, focusing our energy on us and the evil that we do and we can't seem to get over it. And he says, I call this to mind. I bring this back to my memory. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. You know, it's, it's really fascinating. We live in a world, in a society, and I think, I think the older I get, maybe I, I get more crotchety. I don't know. Does any of you like that? <laughs> this younger generation, you know, they, they're so entitled. They feel like they're so entitled. You know, we live in a world where people assume that they are, they are going to have and they're not actually looking at the world properly. You know? And if we understand the fact of our reality as human beings, that we are sinners and we live in a sinful world, and God is a holy, righteous God, in every day of our lives, we are making choices against him all the time. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. You can take that and move away. We spit in God's face almost on a daily basis, on a regular basis part of our life, and yet we expect God to bless us. God, we're going to do it our way, how we want to do it, but yet we, we are really troubled when we're in trouble. <laughs> we're like, why? It's not fair, God, that you did this to me. It's not fair that this is happening to me. My life is it's unfair, it's unfair, it's unfair. Like we're entitled to have an abundance of God's grace and goodness despite how we treat him on a regular basis. It's, it's interesting. He says, I call this to mind because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Listen, if we got what we deserve from God, would we be here now? We would not. If we got what we deserve from God, we would be consumed a long, long time ago. But because of God's love and his great mercy, we are not consumed. Yeah. Yes. His mercies. Mercy is what, what he doesn't give us. Grace is what he does give us that we don't deserve, but mercy is what he doesn't give us that we do deserve. 
and it's because of his love we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, they are new every morning. And boy, this morning was one of those mornings where you can just see and feel the presence of God as you saw the sunshine just flowing across the horizon and the warmth of the sun, and you're like, wow, they are new every morning. His mercy, his compassions, his love are new every morning. Every time we get up, we have a new day. <laughs> we have a new opportunity to serve the Lord and to see his goodness. I don't deserve to wake up in the morning, but God has actually given me this opportunity. And life that we have is not one that's entitled, but one that's on, on bonus for God. I don't have to keep looking at my circumstances and saying, God, this isn't fair. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve this. And the truth is, I don't deserve actually anything that's good. <laughs> that's the truth. And everything that I have is bonus to what I deserve. I need to change my perspective and my attitude. And when I start looking up and considering who I am and what I've done and what I really deserve and what I actually have, I start seeing what I have with gratitude and thanksgiving Instead of being mad and frustrated about the opportunities and things that aren't coming my way, I see the things that God has given me and how I can use them for him. I change my perspective when I start looking at things the right and proper way. Not from an entitled perspective, but in this perspective that I, I am a lowly sinner and I know an amazing, loving, compassionate, merciful God. Great is his faithfulness. They are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. The God that we know, the God that we love, is the God who loves and cares for us and gives us opportunity, gives us grace and mercy and compassion, and he gives us a new day every morning. We get to start new every morning. It's pretty amazing. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on him. Now, I grew up in a large family. I have nine brothers and sisters. And um, this idea of portion is an interesting concept because... In my family now, with my two kids, my wife dotes on them like whatever they want. She makes like two different meals, even. It's, it's craziness. So they have no idea about portion. But I grew up in a family of nine, uh, ten kids, and my twin brother and I were the youngest of the ten, and I had five older brothers. So if there was any meat, what do you think happened to that meat? <laughs> yeah, there usually wasn't a ton because there was a lot of mouths to feed. And if there was any uh, at all. So my mother used to feed us military style, right? So she would portion out the meat, right? <laughs> she'd make lots of potatoes because that would fill us up. But she, she'd portion out the meat. And, and the, so we would have to go through military style and get our food. And we sat down at the table. That's the way she did it. And she did it that way because she loved her youngest children <laughs> as much as she loved her oldest children. And, and the Lord is my portion, it's interesting. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. You know, we are, we are, we're looking for a different way of being satisfied. I mean, this whole season we've been in, in this election cycle, it's crazy, it's not even over yet, even though it's kind of over. It's insane. Like somehow we're going to be satisfied if something that's happening on this earth and this planet is the way we want it. That the life that we have is the way we want it. That the house that I have is the way I want it. That the, the job I have is the way I want it. The, whatever is here in this place is somehow going to satisfy me. But actually, I'm here to tell you that this world doesn't actually satisfy. It can give you temporary pleasure. It can give you some kind of happiness. But the ultimate sense of satisfaction for your life and for your soul is God himself. And when you come to understand that, you start to see that the Lord is my portion. And all, those, all these other things are happening to me. All these circumstances are, are out of my control. My health and my family and other people making bad decisions or myself making bad decisions. I am not finding my satisfaction and my total sense of fulfillment and, and completion as a person in these things. I find it in the Lord. See, the Lord is my portion. He's the one that truly satisfies me. So I wait for him. I wait for him. That's really hard, because we're, we're tempted all the time to think that our portion is something else. 
all the time. We live in this world, and we're, and we're sinful people, and we're highly sensitive, and we have a lot of senses, uh, sensitivity around us, and we're like, oh, okay, well, maybe that's our portion. Maybe I should give in my, my longings and my desires for that, or maybe that will satisfy me, or maybe this will make me happy, or maybe this, and, and we, we're, we're always moving around trying to find this other thing that's going to make us happy and make us satisfied and give us fulfillment and contentment. But the truth is, it's, it's the Lord that's my portion. And when you can start to understand that the Lord is your portion, that you don't deserve anything from him, yet he gives you grace and mercy, and you have a new day. Every morning his, his, his mercies are new. And today is the day the Lord has made, and he's given it to you for his goodness and for uh, your joy. I need to stop focusing my attention on myself, my inner... My, I have one of my sons, he's an Eeyore, he focuses totally internally. And he's always down. Occasionally he looks up and gets happy, but most of the time he's down and he's Eeyore. And he's circling around and around. And as you start to look inside of yourself, you're going to realize that, yes, you're inadequate. Yes, you're a loser. Yes, you can't. Yes, you're not able to. Yes, you don't have control. And the more you focus on you, the, the, the lower you're going to go. You start focusing around you and you see all the circumstances of things that are happening and all the things that are unfair and unjust and don't seem right and things that you can't control. You're going to get swallowed up with all the things that you can't manage. And so if you want to hope, if you want strength, if you want encouragement, you need to look up. Look up to your creator, the one who made you and loves you, who gives you opportunity and whose mercies are new every morning. Now, Isaiah chapter 43, uh, verses 16 to, to 18. Actually, I'm, I'm missing a verse here. I skipped over. 43, verses 11 to 13. God says this. Now, it's interesting in this passage of Scripture in chapter 43, God wants to really say something to his people, children of Israel. And he wants to say something to them, and he wants to get their attention. So he, he opens up this introduction with a lot of laborious, laborious work to get people to actually listen to what he's going to say. So listen to how he sets the tone, how he prepares his people to actually listen to what he has to say. They want, I want you to hear what he has to say to you this morning. He says, I, even I, am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no Savior. So he's really... Letting people, hey, I've got something to say to you, and, I, and I'm, the, I'm the one. I'm the, I'm, I'm the highest. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I, not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, from ancient days, I am he. I'm about ready to tell you something, and I'm God. So please stand up and listen. <laughs> That's what he's saying. From ancient days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? No one can reverse it, of course. It's rhetorical. So he's saying, listen, I've got something to say to you. I'm the God of the universe. I'm the God of eternity. I'm the God who can do anything. Would you please listen to what I have to say? He goes on to say in verse uh, 16, he says, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. So to the children of Israel, they would know this story, the story of Moses, of course, and, and when they're at the Red Sea. And this story is an amazing story. So he says, I'm the God of that story. I'm the, I'm the Lord who has made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. And as the children of Israel had escaped from Egypt and marched and found themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the mountains and the armies of Pharaoh, they were going to be completely decimated and they had no power to change any of their circumstances. They were in a place, in a situation where God had actually led them to that place but yet they were powerless to get out of it. They were going to be destroyed by the armies of Pharaoh, and they didn't know what to do. Their ability, their power, their reasoning, their logic, their rationale, their teamwork, their efforts were going to get them nowhere. They had no way out on their own. And it's interesting, God speaks to Moses, and he says, Moses, what do you have in your hand? (laughs) It's interesting. What do you have in your hand? He says, raise it up. And when Moses raised his hand up with the rod that he had in his hand. What happened? Do you remember? He raised up his rod to the water, and the waters parted. The Red Sea parted. Now, the estimate, somewhere between one 
to 5 million people were with them in Israel. Like, we don't know the number because we weren't there and nobody did a head count. But they estimate somewhere, if it's more than 50, it's a lot. So, <laughs> so that's, that's over 3 million people. And, and the, the waters of the Red Sea part, and there's walls of water standing up on either side in this dry ground between them and the other side. And they walk, they march across this dry ground in the blessing and the awesome wonder and the power and the provision of their God who made a way for them when there was no way. And as they walk across the dry ground to the other side, and they're looking at these walls of water. I mean, it must probably be the first aquarium, right? They could see the fish swimming in. <laughs> walls of water. They walk on dry ground. And they get on the other side. It's very fascinating because as they're walking across this dry ground, they get to the other side. The armies of Egypt are chasing them on chariots, and they want to kill them and destroy them. And they are the people of God. And they're, they're witnessing this wonderful, miraculous power of God who made a way for them in, the, in, this, in this amazing place in the Red Sea. And they have to be like completely, like, it must be surreal. Right? They're, they're, they're riding their chariots, coming after the Egyptians, coming after the Israelites, and they're looking at, at this thing, and they're, and they're walking in the blessing and the power and the wonder of God that wasn't made for them. So when the Israelites get onto the other side, what does God do to these waters, to these walls of water? And he destroys the enemies of God, the ones who they didn't know how they were going to conquer, and they were not able to conquer on their own. God had made a way for them through the sea, and he had destroyed their enemies at the same time. It's incredible, incredible story. But this God, <laughs> this God who has made a way, and he wants to be really clear to them, that the God of creation, the God from the very beginning, this, this God, the Jehovah God, the one who has always existed, is wanting to say something to you. He wants you to hear something from him. This one who can do anything in impossible situations, he can find a way for you to get out that won't be on your power and on your terms, but on his. This God wants to say something to you, and this is what he wants to say. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Most of us are living our life in constant frustration and focus on what's happened to us in the past. Did it happen? It happened. Was it horrible? Likely. <laughs> but we have, we have set our gaze and our energy and our focus on our past, and because we're focused on our past, and we want to keep the past, and we want to retain the past, and the past, the past, the past, we can't actually live in the present, and we can't reach for the future because we're so consumed with the past. And the God that we know, the, the God of the Bible, is the God of new. He puts a new song in our heart. He made a new covenant with us through his son, Jesus Christ. He makes us a new creation he redeems, he takes what's old and garbage, and he makes it new. And he wants to do a new thing in you. He wants to do a new thing in this church. He wants to do a new thing in your marriage. He wants to do a new thing with your relationship with your kids. He wants to do a new thing with the people who need Jesus in this community. The God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God who made a way through the wilderness when we couldn't see a way, when we couldn't figure it out, when we don't, like, there's no way, there's no way we can get out of this. It's not possible. It's not possible. And, well, with God, all things possible. This God, he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I'm doing, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland. You know, in that marriage that's so dry and brittle, he says, I'm, I'm bringing streams in the wasteland. I'm giving new life, new opportunity. I'm going to bring some growth. I'm going to bring something new. I'm going to make a way. Not because you're awesome, not because you figured it out, but because I'm awesome and I can figure it out and I'm the one who can do it. Our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in our circumstances. Our hope is not in each other. Our hope is in who? Our hope is in the Lord, the one who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. 
He says, look, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14. We'd read already a little bit in Jeremiah this morning, but in this passage of Scripture, is really powerful, and most of you already know it. He says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me, and I will listen to you when you seek me and find me, when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. See, the reason why we have hope is not because we have ability. The reason why we have hope is not because we together have opportunity. The reason why we have hope isn't because the world is for us and there's tons of potential. The reason why we have hope is because we have a God who can do anything. And so our hope is found in him. And he says, I have plans for you. It's not whether I have plans for you as a person or a sis has plans for you as an organization. Our, our confidence is in God who has plans for you. God has plans for you. And so we can have hope. He has plans for your marriage. He has plans for your children. He has plans for your situation that you're wrestling with. He has plans for your sickness and that you are struggling with. He has plans for your neighbors who need Jesus desperately. He has plans. God has plans. So our hope isn't in our plan. Our hope is in God's plan. He says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's interesting, you know, when I got married, I learned a lot of things about God. I learned a lot of things about God. So God made man and woman in his image. And there's somehow, there's this completion of the image of God, both in the male and the female. And there's so many things that I didn't understand because I'm a male, and there's still things I don't understand because I'm male. But I'm learning. I'm trying to learn, ladies. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> But I learned this thing about God in a really powerful way, which is clear in the scripture and it's seen here. You see, with my wife, if she suspects that I don't love her completely, like totally 100%, 1,000%, totally her, when she's not the first, the priority, the ultimate of my life, it doesn't matter what I give her, what I say to her, how I treat her, guess what? It's not happy days. Not happy days. But if my wife knows that she's first and that I love her and her only and that she's the priority of my life in every possible way, when she knows it, that she knows it, that she knows it, I can be the goof that I am, make all kinds of stupid mistakes, and guess what? She still loves me, and the relationship works really well. You know, it's the same with God. God doesn't want us like 80%, 90%, 50, definitely not 50% or 30%. What does God want? 95% of us? Yeah, he wants all of us. This is what he says. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with what? Part of your heart? Most of your heart? All of your heart. And a lot of us are having a hard time finding God because we do not want to come to God like this. We come to God and say, God, you can have all of me, but what I've got in my hand, you can't have. <laughs> right? And God says, ah, I'm not going to reveal myself to you. <laughs> and you're like, God, you don't reveal yourself to me. It's not fair. And God says, I won't reveal myself to you until you come like this. So as a person in your life with Jesus, you have to come like this. Guys, you want to fix your marriage? Come like this. <laughs> That's how you do it. Don't come like this. You girls can say amen. But it's true. It's the same thing. And so when we come to God, we must come to him. We must seek him with all of our heart. And when you as a church family, if you want a future, if you want to understand where God wants to direct you, you can't come to God and say, God, we, we give our church to you, but we want to keep this and this and this and this and this and this and this. We come... How do we come? You've got to come like this. God, it's yours. It's not, it's not ours. It's yours. And we trust you in your future that you want to have us to have. He says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found of you, declares the Lord. <laughs> that's, a, that's a definite statement. 
I will be found by you, declares the Lord. God says to you, you you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. Paul in Philippians says this. He says, but one... Maybe he doesn't. (laughs) I'll read it for you. Did it go off the screen there? I'm sorry. Don't worry, but I'll read it for you. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. It says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Again, he's talking the same language here as was spoken in Isaiah. God does not want to have our head in the past. He wants us to have our full focus on what he wants us to do in the future. So he says, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which God has called me, heaven, wood, in Christ Jesus. You know, when you get up this morning, God has given you a new day. He's given you a new opportunity to pursue him and to accomplish what he has for you. If he was done with you, you wouldn't be here. But you're here. And so we need to celebrate in the joy and the reward of it and not focus on our circumstances, focus on our reality, but focus on our past. We need to focus on our future and press on toward what God has for us. I want to read Isaiah 43 again. It says there in verse 17, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not even in each other. Our hope is in the Lord, the one who's made a way to the sea. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you do and who you are. Thank you that we can know you. Thank you that we have your word to show us what you want to share with us. And may your words that you speak, uh, Lord, today speak clearly into our hearts, into the lives of each person here. By your Holy Spirit, may you reveal to each person what you want them to hear and know. Hope for their marriage. Hope for their future. Hope for their children. Hope for the lost around them and hope, Lord, for this church family and its future that you want to give it. Lord, may our our focus not be on our past, but our focus will be on our future and on you. So, Lord, lead us as you want. We pray in Jesus' name.